This is a watch. Obviously, it's a, a pocket watch. And it keeps pretty good time, given the fact that it was made in 1909. Still ticking, as long as you wind it up. If you look closely, you'd be able to make out the brand name, and it would be a name that you would recognize, but not one that you would recognize as a watchmaker. This watch isn't a, a Rolex. It's not a Citizen watch. It's a South Bend watch. See, in 1909, South Bend was such a hotbed of innovation, creativity, workmanship, and engineering that the very name of our city was a byword for those things. All you had to do to sell watches was to name them after the city of South Bend. The town was the brand. It worked so well that at trade shows, they used to have one in a block of ice, and you could see it faithfully keeping time in there. <laughs> so you might ask yourself, if this was such a good watch, how come I've never heard of it? How come there's no South Bend watch company today? And the answer has to do with this thing. It's called a trench watch. And it became widely used during World War I when soldiers needed to be able to tell the time but weren't in a position to reach into their pockets very frequently. The trench watch became the forerunner of the wristwatch, or as we know it today, the watch. But the good people at the South Bend Watch Company didn't take note of this development. They continued making some of the very finest pocket watches of the early wristwatch age. And by the 1930s, South Bend Watch was out of business. There's a moral to this story, a pretty obvious one, about the fact that you need to innovate in order to survive in today's economy. There's another slightly less obvious, more nuanced moral about what that innovation actually has to be like. But in order to get there, we're going to have to jump around in time a little. First, I want to take you to January 1st, 2012. It was the first day that I took office as mayor and ask you to put yourself in that position. You're 29 years old, so your face was your message in the campaign. And everybody takes it that you were the candidate of new ideas and technology and innovation. And they ask you questions like, Mayor, what's the future of this city going to be in terms of industry? Are we going to be the next nanotech city? Are we going to be a biotech city? Are we going to be a digital city? Uh, what's our industry? What are you going to pick? And they also ask questions like, what city are we going to emulate? Are we going to be the next Silicon Valley with its technology? The next research triangle out of North Carolina with its university relationship? The next Austin with its arts and culture? But as I reflected on those questions, it felt difficult to answer those in a way that was straightforward and honest. And the more I thought about the innovations that really mattered, especially the innovations that had made a difference in my lifetime, the more I began to notice a pattern. The object on the left is a kind of directory that was issued to every student every time you moved into a dorm when I was in college. Uh, it's a little bit blurred for uh, privacy reasons, but you get the idea. It's uh, a book that uh, has pictures of everybody, tells you what dorm room they're in, uh, has their email address and some other key information. A book with pictures of everybody's faces. We called it a Facebook. And the guy in the lower right-hand corner had the idea, along with some others, and he was just a, a guy in the next dorm over from mine, uh, a guy who now has a lot more money than I do. <laughs> he had the idea that you could take this thing and put it online and make it Facebook.com. Two things interesting about this. First of all, it already existed as a concept. He put it online. Secondly, what's amazing about Facebook is it takes something that we already have, namely our friendships, and gives them a different kind of life, allows them to play out in a different kind of space. The object on the right should be very familiar to everybody here. Also a remarkable innovation. But if you think about it, not one that is profoundly new, as though it came from outer space. It's a telephone. But it's also a clock and a shopping list and a camera. All of those things existed before. But none of those things had existed before in one device that you could fit in your pocket. That was the innovation. So as I began thinking about how that pattern might apply to South Bend, I started asking myself what it was that we already had that we might build our innovation out of. And some of the things that didn't seem like they had much value had been refashioned by South Bend to have a new value. In fact, I began to believe that our city's genius is for taking what we've already got, seeing a new value in it, refashioning that thing, and turning it into something that makes sense in modern times. Here, for example, you can see the layout of South Bend, good uh, 120 or so years ago, and you'll see that those railway lines and highways 
that are now very recognizable in our city were already taking shape. Now these were extremely useful in the early industrial age. You might ask yourself whether they're at all useful in the internet age. Well, as a matter of fact, they are, and they're especially helpful to South Bend. But don't let anybody tell you that the internet is not a physical thing. Every time you buy something on Amazon, every time you like something on Facebook, every time you swipe somebody on a social networking app that I've heard about, <laughs> something physical moves. Something happens on an actual physical computer in an actual physical place. And all of those computers have to talk to each other, and they do it through actual physical cables, mostly fiber optic, which, as you might imagine, would be very expensive to lay out in a nationwide network. So what do you do when you're trying to lay out fiber optic uh, apps or fiber optic uh, networks to, to connect the entire country together? Well, you use the right of way that's already there, like railroads or highways. And you set up in the conduit you've already got, which makes South Bend an ex especially convenient place because the internet, just like the railroads, runs right through it. This was the campus of Studebaker and a number of related companies that employed tens of thousands of people in the period leading up to its closure in 1963. The heart of our economy that then became a rusting, decaying, nightmarish from a mayor's perspective area of industrial waste. Until my predecessors had the vision to clear that out. Now, a green field may not seem terribly impressive to you until you realize what this green field represents because of the things around it that once had value and then didn't and now do again, like all that fiber optic connectivity. And also, while we're at it, a bunch of power substations that were set up in order to power factories that are long gone, but the power is still there, which turns out to be very useful if you're in the business of setting up data centers. And so the very first business that established itself in Ignition Park was a data center. You can also see the train station, which once was very useful for passenger rail, now uh, not something that happens in downtown South Bend fell into disrepair, but was again purchased and transformed by somebody who was interested not in its usefulness as a train station or even in the beauty of the building, but in the fact that it sat atop some of the richest connections of fiber optic cable in the country. But I'm not just talking about business and I'm not just talking about technology. This is true all over the city of South Bend. An industrial waterway that once powered industries that depended on water in order to move their, uh, their machinery and their equipment, then became useless, became a liability instead of an asset, was re-envisioned by my predecessors as North America's first ever man-made whitewater rapids. And for a very reasonable fee, our Parks and Recreation Department would be happy to lend you a raft, not so much this time of year, uh, but in the spring and summer to go down it, and it's awfully fun. This bridge, so ugly that I couldn't find a high-resolution photo of it, used to greet people on their way into South Bend. I know because I used to walk through that little concrete bit there, uphill both ways, on my way to school, by the way, <laughs> until a local artist realized that you could gather volunteers, about 900 volunteers, in fact, to transform it into one of the most remarkable pieces of public art that our city had. Taking what was a liability, turning it into an asset. South Bend Central High School closed its doors in 1968. Sat empty for a long time until somebody took a chance and invested in it to become an apartment building. And you could have cool little apartments. You could have one that was the classroom. That You could have one where the, the floor would be the hardwood floor of the old basketball court. The one part that was a liability, not very useful, was the swimming pool. It was no good as a swimming pool anymore. So what do you do with it? Well, they said, let's rent it anyway, see if anybody wants to live there. And the folks who decided to live there happened to be music lovers and got into the habit of putting a band in the deep end and all their friends in the shallow end on couches and turned it into one of the cooler underground music venues in the city. In fact, it's so cool, I probably shouldn't know about it. <laughs> Same thing with Lang Lab, an old factory that got converted into one of the most dynamic public art and performance spaces in South Bend. This is what happens when you take what you've got and you see the new value for new times. Our newest entry into the local art scene, the Birdsell Mansion, an investor, again, took a chance but wasn't able to get tenants into the building until finally a, a, a couple of uh, local young people persuaded him to let them turn it into a living, breathing work of art, complete with a little uh, 70s time capsule here. And in the process, brought hundreds of people through this property that he'd invested in to see it and see what it was worth. So this brings me to the moral of the story. 
And it's important for South Bend as we get ready to celebrate our 150th year existing in our current form and start thinking about what the next 50 or for that matter, the next 150 years ought to be like. The message I take away from the watch isn't just that you got to innovate. Of course you got to innovate. It's about how you've got to innovate. Specifically, that you ought to have locally sourced, homegrown, organic innovation, the same way we're supposed to do with food. That you have to make it new, but you don't have to make it up. You have to be fresh, but you don't have to pull it out of the blue. It's going from the telephone to the iPhone, from the Facebook to the Facebook.com, from the pocket watch to the wristwatch. And if we embrace that flavor of innovation, building on what we've already got, but imagining sources of value that were inconceivable just a few years ago, then we have a chance of becoming not the next Silicon Valley or the next Durham or the next Austin. That's how we become the next South Bend. Thank you.